Street, as I've, as I've talked with people over the last day and a half, I know there's a lot of different viewpoints on this. We're united by our desire to help the good people that use our products and make sure that it's convenient and safe for people to enjoy swimming. So I uh, will introduce our panelists, uh, starting with Richard Falk. 25 words, 25 go. 25 words. So I'm not originally uh, in the uh, industry at all. I actually was a pool homeowner and then 15 years ago had a problem with my pool and uh, pool water chemistry related and uh, just got dove deep into the science of it. I went out to pool forums and discovered things that were different from what uh, industry was saying and then just got deeper and deeper and then eventually ended up in the uh, 2015 in the ad hoc committee uh, reporting uh, stabilizers as part of the Council for the Model of Product Health Program. So that. I'm Roy Bohr. Uh I'm a PhD microbiologist and working in this industry since 1991. So a lot of the things we're talking about, it's like I do in the lab every day, and I've run a few pools all over the entire country in this. Uh, so it's like well, I've got almost 30 years doing this kind of stuff. My name is Ellen Meyer. I work for Innovative Water Care. I'm a chemist, and I've been in the water industry for about 30 years and the pool industry for about 20 years. And um, I've been on the cyanurate um, ad hoc committee, and so we've been deeply immersed in the cyanurate issue for um, for a while now. So hopefully, we'll have some good information for you guys. I'm Rudy. I'm a pool guy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we'll just uh, start by taking a question and we'll give each panelist a chance to respond uh, to each question and then we'll move on. Does anyone uh, get us started? Um, okay, so I have a two part question because the first part of my question is pretty straightforward. Um, have any of the panelists personally conducted research on CYA? If, if you mean uh, lab or field research, no. If you mean uh, research and research, in other words, if looking at papers and getting a paper published in the journal Water, uh, yes, because that's what we're at. Uh, I've done an awful lot of pill studies over the last few years. Recently, more focusing on just pure bleach than anything else. But as Richard points out, the entire ad hoc panel spent about four years reading the old historical literature. So there's not much new coming out on this. This is old data we're talking about. As far as bacteria studies, um, no. Um, it's tech for you know, looking through the literature. Um, but we have test tools um, with my company, and so we've done algae studies, we've done studies on looking at the effect of cyanic acid on plaster. So we've done a number of different kinds of studies with cyanic acid. I've actually done a lot with um, black algae over the last year or so, but this year I decided to delve into cyanuric acid a little bit deeper. I know one of the things that we're always looking for is a good way to reduce that level. And I've actually had some success over the course of this summer. Actual swimming pools uh, with high cyanuric acid levels utilizing aluminum sulfate at various pH levels, water temperatures, over extended periods of time and in different dosages. And I've actually been able to, in several of my last um, few runs, reduce the cyanuric acid level in three pools by 50%. Does that count? That how, long? how long did it take you to do that? How long did it take you? Can you Part two. Exactly. The question was how long did it take? Three days. Um, what do you believe to be the single greatest issue um, with a high cyanuric acid level? So, uh, I, I, I don't mean to sound negative about the question, but it's really not the right question. Um, 
And the reason is, is that um, a high cyanuric acid level by itself really doesn't tell you very much. Um, and the reason is, is that uh, the, what, the way the pool chemistry works, in terms of having uh, the active disinfectant and oxidizer in the pool and algae prevention, also the oxidizer, the swimsuit, skin and hair oxidizes and all that, it's not related to the cyanuric acid by itself. It's related to the free chlorine and cyanuric acid ratio, the relationship between them, because of the way the chemistry works. Most of the chlorine in pools that have cyanuric acid, most of the chlorine is 97, 99% in most cases, is bound to cyanuric acid. And is, I wouldn't call it, it's not inert in the sense that it is available in terms of being released when needed, but in terms of active and instantly being there to disinfect and prevent algae and so on. Uh, it's a very small percentage that's there. So uh, you can have high cyanuric acid levels if you have a higher free chlorine level proportionally. Uh, and so at least in terms of disinfection and oxidation and other things like that, um, there's not an issue with it. Now, from a practical side, from a, and it's actually Rudy would be better at that answering this part of it, in terms of practical side from pool operators, depending on the type of pool and so on, they may have more issues with the higher CYA from um, if something goes wrong point of view, in terms of how to deal with it. But in terms of just operating when things are in good shape, um, you can have high, high cyanuric acid, you have higher free chlorine proportionally with it. From the chemistry, there's no problem with that. Okay. Uh, from the microbiology viewpoint, you're dealing with this, uh, typical bacteria and Giardia in there. The ratios that we're talking about now in the model aquatic health code, 2 ppm and 90 ppm of CYA, is somewhere in that range. The data from the CDC says that's not causing an issue right now. And so from the practical point of view, we're talking about practical point of view of disinfection, the real, the real world data says there's not an issue right now. But if you are talking about cryptosporidium, it is not a CYA issue. If you are running a public pool, it doesn't matter whether you've got CYA in that public pool or not. You better be running an ozone system or a UV system because that's the only way you're ever going to control crypto. So from the out, from the chlorine sensitive germs, the data says we're fine with our current practices. Crypto, different issue. And that's another task force that we'll be working on. Uh, yeah, the accidental fecal release. That's a, that's a different issue. Uh, Corey's is saying that we're not having issues with the current. Um, as far as the outbreak statistics, those are coming from CDC, but in order to be included in those statistics, a lot of things have to happen. And I'm, just, I'm not going to ask for people to raise their hands, but just think about how many times in your lifetime you've had diarrhea. A, a number of times, probably, right? How many times have you actually gone to your doctor and gotten treated for it? And how many times has that doctor actually gotten a stool sample to analyze it to see if it has crypto, to see if it has Giardia in it? And then how many times has that been reported to a public health authority? And then how many times has that has the public health authority actually made a link between you and somebody else who has had that same symptom then from a common source? So that is the only way that those statistics then are going to make it into the CDC's surveys. So could there be lots of people getting ill that we're not hearing about from pools? Absolutely. Do we have the data to prove it? No, we don't, because it takes a lot for it to be reported. Um, so, as far as are we okay now, <laughs> that's, that's what we're debating now, right? We all agree that HSCL is a primary sanitizer. How much do we really need? That's what we're debating. I happen to think it was a wonderful question. <laughs> <laughs> I think the single biggest thing or the single biggest problem with a high cyanuric acid level is that when folks calculate the Langmuir saturation index, they're not taking it in its impact on total alkalinity into account. At least not everybody. And what's happening then is they're damaging the pool. I'd say that's the single biggest thing. After that, it's awfully misunderstood. Those would have to be the two big issues. I'm going to almost agree with everything Ellen said. Now, those of us that have known Ellen and me, we've argued on this for years. It's like there's one other bit of information that is not coming out. The CDC numbers also say that 11.8% of the time in public pools, the health department shuts the pool down due to zero chlorine or less than one ppm. 
So yes, we are getting sick in pools, and those are many of the chlorine-sensitive germs. So are people getting sick? Yes, and part of it is our collective faults for not following what we're being trained to do. Sorry, folks. That's the numbers. One more question. So most, a lot of what was discussed was with respect to disinfection. Um, but there's also a flip side, which is or a, a related side that also follows from the chemistry that the ad hoc committee did not look at, but that comes from other sources as well, including pool forums, the residential side in particular, like bubble free pool, and that's algae prevention. So, in terms of the operational side, again, the things that you want to read that goes with it, there may be reasons to manage cyanuric acid and free chlorine in a way that does algae prevention and or have other supplements and doing all that in the mix. So there's that as well. So there's disinfection, there's, chlorine does an incredible job. It takes a very relatively small amount of chlorine to disinfect, except for things like crypto where it needs so much chlorine that it's effectively not, not handling it. So um, what our studies we're doing, we're looking at the one that's kind of, we're looking at all the, uh, all the three main ones, and Giardia popped out as perhaps being on the edge, and that's where there's a controversy about where you draw the line and how accurate is it and all that. But in addition to disinfection, there's also the algae prevention side, but the committee didn't look at that, but in your day-to-day, -day, I mean, anybody that's a pool operator, that's what you're fighting against, not fighting against in the pools, people getting ill from a bacterial infection, you're fighting against the pool getting dull, cloudy, uh, you know, visible algae growth, unusually high chlorine demand and so on. Right? Just wanted to distinguish those. Um, I read, read a little bit of information about using melamine to get rid of CYA. Do y'all address that or do you have any information to share with us? Yeah, it's a, it, it's a horrible, uh, it creates a precipitate. I did uh, try it just because on the pool forums, you know, we wanted to try all kinds of things. And, and we had heard that it creates a precipitated cloudy mess, and the answer is yes, it does. So then you end up having to just use a clarifier to try to get it all to the, to the uh, filter. And the problem is, is that it also leaves a residual so that then, okay, you got your pool clear, now cyanuric acid goes up, and it immediately is going to cloud with the melamine that's left over. So you, it's not a practical um, solution. But the lung is very, you know, let's get through to that. So here's the thing, when you use melamine, um, and you add that to water that has cyanuric acid in it, we all know it forms a new compound, melamine cyanurate, which is completely insoluble. So what we're doing basically is we're pulling it out of solution, which is the cloudy mess that he spoke about. But instead of going with a water clarifier here also, you can go with a coagulant like aluminum sulfate, just drop it all out to the floor of the pool, and then just back it out to waste and not have to worry about any of those other things. The big issue with that is the cost. It's a one-to-one -one ratio, and melamine's expensive, and it's gonna take a lot of it to make it come down. That's why I started doing the experimentation with just the coagulant, just aluminum sulfate, and experimenting with the different pH and so on, and temperatures and times and parts per million of aluminum sulfate alone, and to find a better way, something that was um, cost effective that we all could use. I got yelled at too many times for trying it. It's like I remembered a few years, uh, yeah, I don't want to go there. <laughs> Really, just a quick question from the lab. On the alum, is it higher pH that's the more effective way to come? No. No. Lower pH. Yeah. Yeah. Before, we get too much, before we get too much further in this, can I ask Rudy a question? Rudy, could you walk us through a scenario um, real quick? We have a pool that is at 8 pH. Uh, the cyanuric acid is at 150 and Chlorine's at a two, alkalinity, everything's in range. pH is about an eight, kind of wants to stay there. And cyanuric acid's at 150. What do we do with the alum in your research that you found? I know you're not a scientist, or maybe you are, but anyway, well, I don't care. What have you found that works with alum, and what do we do to get rid of this CYA? What's the CYA? 
I don't know if I'm ready to put that out just yet until I tested it further and then I'll put out everything. If you follow um, my blog site or if any of you guys happen to be in our group on Facebook, <laughs> hey, he said TFB first, didn't he? No! Right? So if any of you happen to be in that group, I'll publish it there and put it out. I want to run a couple of more tests, um, take it a little bit further, but then I'll put it out step by step in detail. My goal is not to make money on it, but just to share with everybody because that's what I want to do. I just want to make the industry a little bit better. Hi. Hi, Richard. How are you? Hi. I'd like to take Rudy and Richard to answer this question, and Ellen and Roy, because one manufactures trifluor, one manufactures cal hypo, you're out of it, okay? So, here's my scenario. Richard and Rudy. Take the average. Right. <laughs> Richard and Rudy, you are responsible for a pool in your backyard. It's 50,000 gallons. It is a Marseille plaster finish. You are responsible for its overall longevity in maintaining it and maintaining a budget as far as your sanitizer. I'm not putting a gun to your head, but under this scenario, would you sanitize with Cal Hypo, sodium hypochlorite, or trichlor? Go. <laughs> well, dear from Richard on, Rudy. first. Uh, that oh, that was that was that was <laughs> Can you all hear me without it? <laughs> no, you need the mic. Yeah. So, um, you know, it would be great to always have the simple answers. Um, I'll tell you what I do and what I've done in, in my pool um, and to scale it up. Uh, when it's a larger pool, the chlorine cost becomes more uh, noticeable. So, uh, first off, uh, I lower the phosphate level because if you use one of the, there are different products on the market, but if you use one that's cost effective, the higher concentration uses two of them on the market that are like that. Uh, then it's reasonably cost effective and get the phosphates down. If you have the phosphates lower, the algae grows more slowly, that'll let you have a lower chlorine level. If you have a lower chlor active chlorine level. If you have a lower active chlorine level, less gets reduced in sunlight, I'm assuming it's an outdoor pool. Um, and that means less chlorine gets used up because of the residential environment. It's not a high bather load situation where the I'm bather sorry, load. Sorry, it is a heavy bather load. Okay, see, it, it, the answer depends on the scenario. Sorry, okay. that's why I asked that. Oh, okay, so then I'll, my answer is going to be different then. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, so in the in the high bather load scenario, um, it's mostly about the bather load, not about the sunlight loss. And because you can have up to you know 10 ppm in a day from bather load of chlorine usage instead of uh, one ppm over two point and a half for something like loss, for example. So, um, in a scenario like that, uh, you, you know whether you do the phosphate reduction or not. Yeah, you could do that if you want to keep the algae uh, down. But you're still going to need either if you don't have high chlorine levels, you want to keep chlorine uh, costs down. You're really going to need to supplementally oxidize. So you have a choice. So I can't have an o I can't have a, a UV ozone system, secondary no. disinfection system. You have free choice. Okay. Uh, with high bather load, if you don't want to build up, uh, uh, here are the choices: trichlor, you're going to have every 10 parts per million free chlorine. You're going to have six parts per million cyanuric acid. Cal hypo, every 10 parts per million of free chlorine. You're going to have eight parts per million of, cal of calcium hardness increase. Chlorinating liquid or bleach, your sodium hypochlorite for every 10 parts per million free chlorine, you're not going to get cyanuric acid or cal uh, calcium hardness increase, but you will get 17 parts per million of salt. Salt's the most innocuous. It, I'm assuming you can't put a salt or a chlorine generator on there, according to your question. So salt's the most innocuous. Do that if I don't care about the hauling of, you know, 40 pounds of chlorine, of, of, of four gallons of uh, every time I want to have that. Uh, if I have a tanker come in and fill up a big tank with sodium hypochlorite, then there you go. You're in charge of this pool. What's your answer? Like I just I said, the least innocuous is going to be the hypochlorite that doesn't add calcium or uh, uh, cyanuric acid to it. I'm going to answer. Um, you know, but are there other considerations? I don't know the cost differentials of it, or the equipment room, and the size of the tanks, and all that sort of thing that you're going to have to have for it. That might be an issue. 
if you if those are issues, then the next would be the Cal Hypo because you can tolerate more calcium, about two and a half times calcium in the pool than center and gas at all else equal. Um, and then least would be the trichlor homeless scenario. But you're going to want cyanuric acid in there to reduce, you know, loss in sunlight. So it doesn't mean you don't have any cyanuric acid. And also you don't want it too harsh on the bathers. But um, from a day-to-day -day ongoing, yeah, the sodium hypochlorite is the least side effects than, than cal hypo and then uh, the trichlor. And then dichlor is even worse because of the cyanuric acid even more. And that's just, those are chemical facts in terms of the buildup, right? Thank you, I was telling you why. He was setting you up. Who do you want to get Richard Given your answer is bleach, would you run one part per million bleach of free available chlorine or four with the right amount of site, the right corresponding amount of site air gas? What's the right? In Florida, are these Is that what your question is? Is what is the right amount of cyanuric acid? Or what is the right amount? Of, are you asking what the ratio should be? One to four. I think that's such a small part of the picture, realistically. And we get too hung up on parts per million, looking at cyanuric acid parts per million. Chlorine parts per million free available chlorine. One of the things we're not considering is ORP, which is a better measurement of the efficacy. Will you smack that guy? <laughs> <laughs> it's a better measure of the efficacy of the chlorine that's in the water. There's a lot of other factors aside from cyanuric acid that can drive ORP down. There's a lot of things that can help it to go up, and I really think that we should look at all of them. But as far as the chlorine level that I'd like to keep in a pool, what's my bather load? The load. Bather load, people. Heavy, heavy bather load? Okay, heavy bather load. So then I'm gonna go at the top end, and keep my pH on the low side, and then I'll use what cyanuric acid level I have to use to maintain my chlorine level at that um, desired result. Every pool is different, it takes a little bit of experimentation. It's not cookie cutter. These are not fish tanks filled with tap water in a lab. These are outside. These are things that ducks crap in. These are things that people stick their butts in. It's butt water. It really is. I mean, there's weather. There's trees in the yard. All of those factors. If you start treating pools like they're cookie cutters, ultimately you're going to fail on a large scale. I lean more toward uh, treating the pool as an individual, a lot like they do in the personalized medicine trend. You evaluate the patient, and that's what we do. We're out there on the site, and we need to be able to make those decisions. I don't know of any pool that's been able to maintain a constant chlorine residual at exactly one number the entire time. Um, and so my advice would be, you know, if you're going to have heavy bather load at the beginning of the day, put it at the top of the range, right? And then when your bathers go down, it's going to go down. And you just try to maintain at least that minimum. Um, and as far as federal law is concerned, we're a chlorine manufacturer, right? Um, and so we're regulated of what we can put on our labels. So this says one to four parts per million is what we can put on our labels. And so, um, and that is federal law. Um, so that's what I would recommend is obey your federal laws and um, maintain one to four parts per million. I'm going to agree with Rudy on this one, and almost again agree with Ellen on this one. <laughs> and, uh, it's like, we've all been run pools. Run the pool the way that keeps the people safe. you got to have enough chlorine in there, and if you've got that big party that jumps in there at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, or if you get the 1,000-gallon pool, and the, the basketball team or the softball team jumps in that pool, and you're trying to run at 1 p.m., you're crazy as a loon, people, and we all know that. You've got to run that chlorine level up, and then you've got to run it by the right pool. And it's like, in, in addition to that federal law, you've got that state law. And if the, if the Department of Health is telling you what to run, you better be following them, because they're the ones going to be shutting you down, not the US EPA. So, uh, you know, I, in addition to wanting to just bring science as much as possible into the pool and spa industry, uh, I also want to just have uh, regulators do the right thing. And so as part of that is this EPA rule. And the EPA rule is really uh, unduly restrictive. 
and it is what it is right now, but the right thing to do is to get the four up uh, to give a lot more leeway in terms of the free chlorine level that's available in the pools. Because the most important thing is, as Roy says, is it not to get the chlorine down to zero, whether it's in a pool or a spa. And if you need more to have uh, more buffer, more leeway to go with, fine. As long as you're managing the ratios of cyanuric acid free chlorine and so on, you can keep the pool safe, keep the pools algae free, and also have plenty of buffer of chlorine that's not going to run out. So that's really critical. Um, the, I'll just make one little comment there, or that is something I, I disagree with. Um, I do agree that I do. ORP is useful as a measure for what other things are going on in the pool. Uh, we have a lot of reducing agents and so on, but it's also affected by hydrogen gas bubbles from solar chlorine generators. It's affected by things that a lot of them they're not um, related to the disinfection capability or oxidation capability of chlorine. So it's a it's a careful tool. If you know what you're doing, you can use it. But you know, uh, for me personally, I think measuring with your test kits the chlorine and cyanuric acid, and then Rudy brought up a really good point: don't destroy your plaster. <laughs> you know, understand carbon output. There are two online tools. You don't have to do it in your head. You know, use the right online tool to work on your uh, phone that calculates it right. Uh, keep your saturation index saturated so that your plaster is protected. So between that and the safety of the users and preventing algae, you can be in good shape with the tools. The high beta load situation, though, just to be frank, is a difficult situation. Where the beta loads that we have that are high are, you know, much higher than in Europe and in other areas that are allowed. Um, and it's it's going to be difficult no matter what you do, and particularly in indoor pools where air quality is always going to be an issue and so on. So there are a bunch of ways of addressing it, but it's, it's a hard not to crack. So a couple of things. Our beta loads are probably a bit higher than in Europe, but so are our turnover rates. In Europe, they're looking at a turn on a pool of once every 24 hours. That would be a huge challenge here. The other thing is, is looking at ORP, to Richard's point, if you know how to use it, it's a great tool. If you don't, then it's not. But I like to give everyone here the credit that this is something that y'all can do. And if you don't know how to do it right now, I'm sure with minimal amount of direction, we'd be able to figure it out. Now, I'm not suggesting that we utilize ORP alone and not look at the chlorine level, not look at the free available chlorine. I'm looking at it as being, instead of a ratio of so much to so much, here's a measure of how well it is actually working instead of just a blanket ratio that we throw out to all geographical locations across the entire country, across wherever, and say that, you know, 20 to 1, whatever it works out to be, this is what you need to be at, and that's going to be great in your pool, right? Because your pool is obviously going to be the same as yours, right, Derek? Say hi. Hi! That's Derek. He's the guy with the cool haircut in the front. But the whole point being is you can't come out with, pools aren't cookie cutter, you can't come out with a cookie cutter program. We need something else to separate it, and ORP might be the way to go. So yeah, I'm not saying not to look at cyanuric acid. I know that lowers ORP, but let's check the ORP and see where it's at and function at what we need to function at best in our pools. As a retailer and a service provider, what am I telling my customers that come in with high CYA levels? Are we draining and refilling? Are we compensating with additional fluorines? What's the protocol for that? Good question. So the answer, similar to what was said before, it depends on what, um, largely depends on that. The short answer would be, if it wasn't the EPA winning part of it, it would be, yeah, in the short run, Raise the pre-chlorine level relative to the cyanuric acid and give you more runway. At some point, you're going to run out of, you know, the cyanuric acid gets too high, you're going to run out of runway, and you'll have to talk about drain refill or other method, or the Rudy method when he publishes it to reduce the cyanuric acid or what have you, right? So uh, now, if you, but if you're going to have to decide, are you going by the state regs, which many of them are 8 to 10 ppm, uh, some are low though, some are even lower than the 4 ppm of pre-chlorine, or not. Um, in a residential environment, it's going to be easier to, deal with that way because there's less, I mean, just being frank here, less lawsuits, less, you know, there's less going on in that environment than in the French Republic side. But that's, you're going to have to decide, because Alan's right, I mean, it's, you know, it's technically, I mean, I read the labels, it's a violation of federal law to exceed this thing, you know, if that's, so, so that's just the way it is. 
it comes back to one of those things on like, what is that pool there? It's like you're if it's a public pool, you're under the state code, and most of them will say what your maximum level of CYA is going to be. And uh, in Georgia down there, it's like the health department will shut you down if you're in violation of you know alkalinity. And so it depends on where you are, what that limit is going to be. But you know, in uh, there's not any good way right now to reduce cyanuric acid levels. Well, other than out in California, they got those RO, RO units out there. But then you got the same problem with bleach. You get high TDS levels, you get running calcium, hypochlorite, you're getting calcium. You have to manage for the type of disinfectant that you're using. Everything's got its good side, and everything's got its bad side. And it's like, you got to treat the pool and the chemical like us. We're people. I think the treatment's already been covered pretty much. Um, I like to cover prevention. So if you can prevent your cyanuric acid from getting high using unstabilized sanitizers, uh, that would be the way to go. So you don't have to worry about draining, you don't have to worry about doing RO or, or doing the magic fruity treatment with Alan. I think Richard should refer to it as the Rudy treatment on TLP. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing. Here's the here's, it's residential customers that you're talking about, okay? So even with your commercial pools, your public pools, hotels, apartment complexes, whatever, you guys are, re I mean, it's, it's more than just this because you're also looking at cost. Cost to you, cost to that customer. You have to find the most effective way to handle that situation, to get that level down. You're not always gonna wanna drain water. And you can tell them that's what they need to do. Residential pools or public, it doesn't matter because they look at replacing water as costing money. All of these different things that we're coming with, there's a cost associated with that. And we need to come up with some cost-effective solutions, and that's how you relate to your backyard customer. That's how you relate to your hotels and apartment company. I, I mean, I was out there, my cyanuric acid levels in the pools that demand that they use trichlor, which I was fine with if that's what they wanted to do. That's cool. No, I should stay. But, but you get to a point where they need to drain the water. They have to approve that. You can't just do that on your own as a service person, right? So you got to get them to do that. And you tell them, and you tell them. And realistically, sometimes it actually takes the health official telling them that, hey, you have to drop that level or we're going to close you down before they're willing to do it. We're only going to do what we get paid to do. That's all we can do. And we can't absorb a lot of these costs ourselves either. So that's one of the things that I would challenge or task the industry as a whole with doing. If we're gonna come up with these different methods, we need to come up with cost-effective ways of implementing them before owning a pool just becomes too expensive of a thing to do at all. We definitely wanna grow the industry and prevent problems as much as we can. Hi there. I wanted to ask, what is the debate? What, what, are, what exactly are we debating? What is what are we debating? What is the what are we debating? So um, that's a that's a good question. Um, so there's there's different. It's not always clear what parts are considered controversial or not. I think the um, I have a, a rough sense of it, except that uh, I think what it, the bottom line always comes down to is, is you know, we have, uh, you know, let's be frank, it's very strong commercial interests, you know, multi-billion dollar market, uh, chlorine market, this is not a new issue, but it's been around for, you know, more than 45, 45 years ago, the paper came out that talked about it. Let, let me show you something. So, there's a paper in 1974 that came out. Oh, I have to turn off the other guy. So. Okay, there's a paper that came out in 1974, which was a technical paper that defined what are called the equilibrium constants for chlorine and cyanuric acid. So it's basically the way that chlorine attaches to cyanuric acid, how strongly, and what are all the different chemical species involved, and all that. And that, and from that chemistry comes the uh, ratio. Uh, producing constant disinfection and so on. The constant 
hypochlorous acid and other papers show that that's related to disinfection. Notice that there's a couple of things to look at. First is this sentence. Now, what does that mean? What chemical methods for estimating free chlorine concentrations include chlorinated cyanurates as well? What that means is, is that the free chlorine that you're measuring in your test kits, all of them, whether it was the old OTO one or the newer, the, the uh, not that new, DPD tests or the FAS DPD tests, or uh, those are all measuring the chlorine, all of it, including what is bound, not all, not, not to combine chlorine, but it's including the chlorine bound to cyanuric acid. So it's measuring the, res mostly measuring the reserve or reservoir of chlorine, not the active amount, not the part that's killing algae, killing bacteria, disinfecting, oxidizing skin, swimsuits, hair, outgassing, and so on. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. So most of the chlorine is this, again, it's not inert, but it's not the main active uh, ingredient, okay? The second thing is this point, and again, this is 1974, 45 years ago. Although chlorinated cyanurates serve as a reservoir of free chlorine, bacterial and the free chlorine that they define as free, they're talking about the, not what we call free, they're talking about this the part not bound to cyanuric acid. Bacterial cytal efficacy is more closely related to the relatively small fraction of free chlorine present at equilibrium. Therefore, the use of excessive cyanuric in an overly zealous attempt to reduce photolysis, that's the breakdown of sunlight, of chlorine from sunlight, um, uh, may repress free chlorine to the point of suppressing germicidal activity. For the same reason, the continual addition of chlorinated cyanurates as a source of chlorine is not recommended because this will lead to a buildup of cyanuric concentration. Again, this is 45 years ago. So the debate is that trichlor is an incredibly uh, convenient product because of its slow dissolving nature and its not having a, the main side effect of it being the um, cyanuric acid buildup. And it is also acidic, so there's also a pH adjustment. But for a pool service person, only visiting once a week, you know, great. Dissolve slowly, five, roughly five days. You can go a week, put more in a, in a tab that's uh, in, a, in a, a floating feeder that's popping down or an inline coordinator. That's the main reason it's existed for so long. I mean, notwithstanding that they're, the, you know, advertising and other things that companies have with it, it's not, that's, let's be frank, it's not just because of good advertising it exists, it exists because it has that strong benefit of a slow dissolving product. It's practical. You don't have to add chlorine in the pool every day or two. For the hypochlorites, as a general rule, notwithstanding the, the you know, some newer Cal Hypo tabs and there's also Cal Hypo feeder type things with dissolving and then pumping and such, they're the, uh, for many of the hypochlorites, they have to be added every day or two, unless you have a pool cover or something keeping really low chlorine usage. So that's why there's this big dichotomy. You got trichlor building up cyanuric acid, but it's incredibly convenient. You've got the hypochlorites that are, as a general rule, inconvenient or less convenient, but they have less of the, they don't have cyanuric acid, they either have calcium hardness buildup or they have just the salt buildup only. Um, and that's, so the debate is, um, where do you draw the line and all that, and you've got different businesses competing with each other, right? So they're gonna say what they say. But um, for me, that's where the debate is. What I don't want the debate, so the policy where to draw the line, let them and you and everybody figure that out, I'm fine with, okay? I may have opinions, but I mean, that's, it's, there's all these trade-offs and balances to do. What I'm not so fine with is, is that the core science behind it, that defines the chemistry, is very solid. And that can be used to help manage the pools effectively because if you understand the ratios and such, and you understand that cyanuric acid builds up as an issue, you manage the pool of free chlorine going up as well with it. That's beneficial. There shouldn't be debate. So that's that's just my opinion about the debate. Uh, to follow up on what Richard just said, the model that's come out of the last four years of work is a very, very powerful model. And what it shows is there shouldn't be any E. coli out there. There shouldn't be any pseudomonas out there. It's like, what we're trying to figure out is, is there another issue on there? And after four years, the data is not clear whether there is an issue in there or not on some of the other germs like Giardia. So our issue is, do we have enough data to modify what we're doing today? I think that's where the date of that. And it's where that line is right now. 
have we gathered enough data? And after four years, even the committee is struggling with what is that ratio? So the debate is, where is that line? And do we have enough convincing data to say there is actually a problem? I think um, we're all in agreement that we need to sanitize both, right? So we're all in agreement on that. What level sanitizer do we need? Our active sanitizer in pools is HOCL. How much do we actually really need? So EPA says on our labels one to four, but what about HOCL concentrations? What do we actually need? If you take what's currently in the model aquatic health code, it's a maximum of 90 parts per million of cyanic acid with a minimum of two parts per million of chlorine when you have cyanic acid present. So the amount of HOCL you have in the water at that point is a little over eight parts per billion of HOCL. That's not a whole lot of sanitizer in the water. So is E. coli killed really quickly with even small concentrations of chlorine? Absolutely. But we're also killing Jardia, we're also killing viruses, we're also killing lots of other organisms in the water. Um, our current recommendation from the committee is to do a 20 to 1 ratio of cyanuric acid to chlorine as a minimum, a minimum for your chlorine. So that would mean that you have about 20 parts per billion of HOCL in the water. Is that even enough? Who knows? <laughs> so right, but so we don't have outbreak data, right, um, to, to really show what, um, you know, what is our driving force for change that just have to you know, kind of do a reality check of, okay, is, you know, 8.6, you know, parts per billion of HOCL and up in the water or not. So somebody came up to me just before the debate started and said, Rudy, it's 2019. Why are we debating cyanuric acid? Because none of us can agree on anything. And what we are ending up doing is we're confusing the heck out of people. That's what it is. A year ago, 100 parts per million was okay. Six months ago, we wanted our chlorine levels to be 7.5% of what our cyanuric acid level was, right? And now, 20 to 1 is the ratio. So it changes. And we need to do a better job of all getting on the same page. But we also need to do a better job of accepting the fact that there's more than one way to skin a cat. I'm a dog person. <laughs> but I'd like to, I'd like to respond to uh, something that Richard pointed out really quick. Because the other thing, the other problem is, if it's out there, and you look for it, you can find it. So he pointed out an article from 1974 that said cyanuric acid is a problem. And it affects the way that your chlorine works. Yet I found 1968, Carlson Hasselbeck and Mech of the Water Hygiene Institute, you have to forgive my paper, they won't let me use the TV. <laughs> um, where they've actually proven that E. coli is destroyed within instantaneously is their wording at a redox level of 650 millivolts and that expedites the higher the level goes. That was again um, World Health Organization 1972 again standards for drinking water that an ORP of 650 millivolts in water water is considered to be disinfected and viral inactivation is almost instantaneous. Then again in 1985, James Brown. <laughs> James Brown with the Department of Health in Oregon, PPM versus ORP, you guys can look that one up. But he actually, they went out in Oregon, the health department, 30 portable spas with cyanuric acid levels ranging from zero to 1,300 parts per million, the average between all of them at 228 parts per million, which is much, much higher than what we're dealing with. And what they tested for here, 650 millivolts or higher, knocks these things out instantaneously. They did point out with tougher things like listeria or salmonella, it does take 750 or better. Then I also just finally wanted to say, I've been looking at some of the numbers, and I know it, it almost sounds like you know we're out there hurting people. And I saw in a report that said that for swimming pools, the estimated amount of Jardia episodes or illnesses that are contracted, uh, one out of 395, I think is what's been forecasted for swimming pools. That works out to 25 out of, 
every 10,000 people will contract Giardia. So I decided to look a little bit further. And what I found was, let me flip back here. Thank you, I appreciate it. So US Environmental Protection Agency Office of Water and Giardia Drinking Water Fact Sheet reports that in our drinking water, it's estimated that it is 250 illnesses per 10,000 people. We're already doing better than drinking water, and people stick their butts in our. <laughs> I mean, that's. Come on, go with it. But that's the point. So, what we're looking at is from drinking water alone, if you look at the population of the United States, that works out to 8,236,250 people that are going to contract Giardia just from drinking water. And that's what, 250 per 10,000 versus the 25 per 10,000 that we're worried about. I'm not saying it's not significant. I don't want anybody to get sick. But I don't think that we're doing as bad as sometimes it's made out to seem. So um, a couple things. So I'm not going to go into the detail of it now, but the uh, uh, a while ago there was I did an extensive comparison analysis of URP data from various studies and compared it to hypochlorous acid because I was wondering, well, how much is related? Is there something unique or different about ORP that makes it better? And what I found was just no, it largely tracked the hypochlorous acid. The issue with the ORP I had was is that depending on the sensor that you used and the environment that you used and whether you had. Anyway, it, it varied too much. It wasn't it, as good. So if you, if, you, if you be careful with the ORP and you checkpoint it against free chlorine and then use it for process control, I think it's going to be okay. But I just would caution again by using ORP blindly and with, as just an absolute number. Um, the, uh, the other aspect of the expected Jaria statistics, one thing that just personally when I was on the committee that struck me that I didn't know, just because I'm not, you know, Roy, I'm not the bug guy. I mean, he's, he knows. You know, bugs like the back of his hand for the, for the, for the for microbiology. Um, was how prevalent Giardia is in society. Uh, and as Michael Beach would say from the CDC, he mentioned in a meeting recently, it's the number one parasitical uh, disease. Uh, in 280 something schools, I forget how many it was, but some large number in um, pools, they measured to see how many had Giardia and how many had crypto. None had crypto. Uh, and 4.4% had Giardia. And then we compared against Australia and other places that did more thousands of people measured and such. Giardia is, again, bigger than, than crypto. Giardia is easier to kill, much easier to kill than crypto and swimming pools, which is why it's really kept the cap if you keep, again, don't let the chlorine go to zero, keep a cap on it. But Giardia is a lot slower to kill than bacteria. So the whole purpose of our, not purpose, but the main focus of the, the paper that resulted that we had was is that because Giardia bubbled up to the top, it was the one to take a look at. But the level of infection in the pools, even if you assume that the numbers are right, because they have a lot of variant inputs and so on, is, it's true, at a, it's not at the pants on fire level of you're going to have all these outbreaks. It's more at the low levels, are you, are pools possibly sustaining some portion of Giardia in society. And since drinking water contributes part of it too, there's the valid, you know, it got to compare against that. And also compare against, as Michael Beach would say from the CDC, you know, the number one in his opinion is from the daycare centers. I mean, from a public policy point of view, if we want to really clean things up, let's get some hygiene in daycare centers. And it's not just the kids. It points out that the, 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 the adults in the environment are also exposed to it and so on. So um, these are all valid, you know, that, that's all valid uh, uh, things to and, and when you continue on talking on Giardia, look around the room. Everybody in this room has probably had Giardia multiple times in your life <laughs> and didn't even know it. 80% of the time that you're going to be exposed to Giardia as an adult, it's going to be asymptomatic. You've already got antibodies to it. And so there's probably Giardia in the water. We don't know how much Giardia is in the water. So what we're really arguing about is what we've got is a, uh, if you've ever tried to dig through Richard's spreadsheet that the committee worked on, Tom worked on it, Ellen worked on it, it's like, just give up and call Richard because he'll tell you how to work it because I had to do it because it's really good. And it's a very powerful tool. 
if we collect some more data while we're focusing on the E. coli, the Pseudomonas, the Legionellas, which are causing serious illnesses now, then we've got time to collect that data and then come back in and have that conversation. But until we're handling the crisis today, we're getting people sick because we're not maintaining at least one BPM. Look at the numbers. You're seeing it. Crypto, you cannot be controlling with chlorine. But the Giardia, you've all had it. Every, and it probably came from drinking water, but if you got a kid, I guarantee it came from a daycare center too. Basically, it's all a matter of risk tolerance, right? Everybody has a different level of risk tolerance, which is why we're still debating this issue for the past four decades. Mine's not necessarily a question, it's more an opinion from you guys. I do commercial pools in the state in which our chlorine levels are supposed to be between a 0 0.04 and a 3. You think 0.4? Yes. And we are predominantly trichlor. We've started bringing, you know, liquid back in, but these are commercial pools. And the health department literally is dinging us or closing us if we get above a five. Huh. With cyanuric acid. With cyanuric acid. And I can tell you right now, by the time August runs around, I'm running on a lot of pools. My cyanuric acid levels are close to 100. And at a three, my chlorine level is more or less a zero as far as my free pool. What's your opinion on us as companies and the legality part of it? Handling that and dealing with the health problems. So I'll let them answer more. We, you know, the rules need to be consistent with the science. We and have not adopted, they have not adopted the model of cost. No, I understand. I understand. So I'm going to let them answer the more practical side of what do you do with the constraints in your situation. From my point of view, is I'm more about this, just doing the right thing. So I want to get the rules set up so they're consistent and, and consistent with the science. And that would that would give you more runway to work with. But until then, I'll let them tell you how to how do you deal with it with what you got. Yeah. We've got a number of state codes that is frankly out of date now. If you look at the Georgia state code, I mean you're in the cab code. He, no, he, I'm in I'm in Nashville. Okay, you're in Nashville. You, you confused me with your Georgia sticker on there. I'm the same company, but I just I'm Yeah, in the okay. Nashville. Up in here. It's like I don't know whether Pennsylvania ever changed their code up there, but when I lived up in Delaware a few years ago, the minimum concentration of pre-chlorine in Pennsylvania was 0 0.5. 0 0.5. We've got codes that are like 40 and 50 years out of date. Now, in your situation, not every chlorine is going to work in every pool. Let's be honest about it. And not every pool runs the same. You've got to pick a chlorine that you can operate within that facility. You know? And if you're running on trichlor and you're bumping into that, you might have to be doing water replacement. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, your other choice is like go to bleach. It's like 74, though, he said. Yeah. The HOAs I mean, don't want to replace their water. I mean. And unless the health department actually backs me up. Okay. It's a whole, I can't Here's an it. option for you. I know this person that lives not too far away from you. We need to send her in there to beat up your health department. Go get them, Ellen. <laughs> um, I'm not into violence, so I won't be up your health department, but I do have the name of a Tennessee um, public health department guy who is responsible for pools, and um, I think you need to get a contact member sure. later, um, Brian Mason, and um, it, yeah, it, that, to change codes, it takes a long time to change a code, um, because a lot of it is regulatory, right, and anytime you get politicians involved, it can just take a very long time, but we have to start somewhere, right? So if you're a member of PHCA, uh, Jennifer Hatfield gives really nice summaries of regulatory updates um, that are occurring. And so when a code comes up for change, she will send a note out to everyone so you know that it's time to comment. And you can send in public comments and you can comment and say, hey, you know, we really need to look at this. And you give reasons why. And you give the science behind it. And you give, the, you know, you got to have science, right? You can't just say, I think it needs to change. And then in the meantime, I think to, to use unstabilized sanitizer so you don't raise your sinus gas level too high. So you can get away Sales with pitch the, number two. Uh, point out. <laughs> the, problem is, the problem is, is we, we're we just now getting a liquid chlorine back in the market. We didn't have right. it. Right. 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 She's pointing out how hot it is. Well, if you. 
what I would do in my pools where I had uh, cyanuric acid concerns in Florida is we did have a maximum acceptable level there. We were a little bit more broad on the chlorine you know, we could use. So I do understand where you're at. It's a catch-22. It's a cost factor. You can't absorb it. They're not going to pay it. I get it. So what I would do is alternate between the two the winter months. But I take—I don't know if you guys are probably not open out throughout the winters. No, but they're all stay loose. Oh, okay. so we have to keep it clear. So what I would do is I would use tricor in those pools in the summer months, and then you could switch to cal hypo or bleach during the winter months, and then that way at least it increased at a much slower rate, right. and then extend that down time. As far as the chlorine level itself, if those are the strengths they have you under, which is what they are. Um, I would have to try to see if I can't get my customer and your customers who are paying you as my customer to take you on for more days a week because I know you're not out there seven days a week now. Are Majority of my pools are five, six, or seven days a week. Oh, fantastic. Commercial. So good for you. That's great. Well, yeah, we're commercial. It's not that way everywhere. That's for sure. But five, six days a week is fantastic. Then, like I said, I would go with back and forth juggling. It's just a fight. Yeah. It's a fight back and forth. No, I just wanted to do a really quick yeah. safety caution. If you're going to be switching back and forth between stabilized and unstabilized sanitizers, do not ever combine them in the same feeder. Um, yeah, really bad things can happen, so just be careful. Bad reaction. Very bad. Uh, uh, bad. Uh, 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 and an hour went by really fast. I made a deal with people that uh, they would uh, be up here being grilled for just an hour. Uh, and that went really quickly. I don't know if anyone's willing to stick around and chat any longer or uh, okay. Uh, and I also, I'll, I'll get to a question, I wanted to recognize Bob Lowry, who's sitting in the front row, who also contributed a lot of work over the years to this, uh, to this whole issue. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Something on the drinking so, water. Um, Rudy, you mentioned <laughs> the drinking water statistics when you had that 250. Um, what year was that from? Uh, forgive me for cheating. Oh, right. That was long ago? Or? 1985. So, um, I, not only, I, I'm from the state of Rhode Island and I regulate the public pools there. I, I deal with that. I also drink, deal with the surface water drinking rule, which essentially sets the contact times for drinking water, surface water systems relative to Giardia. So modern standards actually um, are protected against that. And then from groundwater sources, we, we set that contact time back based on um, that, I'm sorry, based on viruses because you would not expect Giardia in groundwater sources unless there's some sort of surface water influence. Giardia was specifically mentioned in that study as being one of the things that were Instantaneously taken out in 600. She has the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh. Almost like you sat there for an hour or something. Yeah, you know. So, Giardia was one of the things, one of the um, protozoa that were looked at in those studies. And what it said was, you know, eradicated, gone. So, no matter what the contact time is, if it's gone, it's gone. It doesn't matter if it was 1966 or 19, you know, 2096. If gone is just it's, so. I don't think the information is that big. That's what I'm saying. So, so I'm gonna come sit here with yeah. you. Just uh, stay over there, Rudy. <laughs> this is where I belong. These are my people. So it's a pool versus drinking water, man. But um, but. The, the point being that modern drinking water treatment systems um, standards deal with that. Um, but the second thing I want to say is for the folks with the pool companies, being on the pool regulation side, I just went through the process of updating our regulation for public pools from 1975 to modern day standards. Yay! And I'm going to tell you, just contact your Department of Health people, educate them on current standards, give them the model aquatics, say this is what's going on. Better yet, give them the references to other states that have adopted these more modern codes. Part of the argument I used was that 20% of the states were relying on these ranges that 
Um, in the old days, we had 0.6 to 1 or 2 or something ridiculous like that. So when you give healthcare professionals, I mean, the, the health department professionals, the information they need to go to, you know, whoever they need to take it to say, you know, look, 25% of the states are doing this, 25% of different jurisdictions are doing this. It carries a lot of weight, and um, that's what I would suggest. Thank you. You're welcome. Everybody for Angela. Yeah, I just want to point out with respect to drinking water standards. So in our paper, we looked at the two uh, types of standards. So there was a drinking water one, which is, you know, one in 10,000 gastrointestinal illness. But as you point out, there's the modern standards have specific requirements for the RV filtration and so on. So, um, and then there's the other standard, which is the higher one that we were looking at for, uh, because there's no way that we're even close to the drinking, but to the one in 10,000 drinking water standard. Okay. For, for either Jario or crypto from a regular just people sloughing, but the risk is levels are very low, primarily because of the amount that's drunk in a pool, you're not using it as your primary drinking water source. Um, but um, that upper line is the one for, uh, if you're going to beaches and you know, lakes and streams and beaches and so on, and that's what that is. And there's a historical standard, is it 36 per 1,000? Is that right? So 36 gastrointestinal illnesses per 1,000. So, you know, Grasping at straws, it's, you know, what standard do you use for swimming pools? Because there isn't one for what's the acceptable risk of gastrointestinal illness infection for swimming pools. So, you know, we had to pick something, we use that, and that's how we were doing something for comparison. Right? So, um, so, yeah, I just wanted to emphasize that the drinking water standard has been very tight. So anyway, um, as I mentioned to you, and I'm not sure everybody heard, I did misunderstand which one you were asking about the reports. The um, EPA drinking water report I did was by 2K. So not yesterday, but not 40 years ago either. You know, when we talk about modernizing our, our practices, let's talk about a little gap that we've got. It's called the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. The current version is OPPTS. 810 which was previously called DISTIS 12, right. and that was published on April the 23rd, 1979. So what did they change between 1979 and four years ago? They fixed two typos. One of them was they left a period out, and the other one is they truncated something and didn't have a letter at the end of the word. Those were the two substantial changes from the EPA since 1979. Thank you, EPA, All for right. helping. Yeah, and, and, and related, related to that specific standard, too. So there's a massive inconsistency in the standard with respect to the, what they call the laboratory efficacy. It's a really tight standard. And then the field study, much looser, more realistic standard, right? And unfortunately, when you have standards in a mismatch that way, you can it's probably prevented certain innovative disinfectants that might have been able to come on board that would have been okay, but because of the laboratory efficacy standard being against chlorine at 0.6 ppm, they weren't available because you didn't need a six log kill to, in practice for your pools to be able to do what we're showing, because we're not. The, the fact is, is that the levels of free chlorine cyanuric acid we're talking about in the pools that are allowed today, and the, Model product health code or otherwise, they're, they, none of them would pass the laboratory efficacy standard. The laboratory efficacy standard was taking pure water with, I mean, buffered water with adding some dichloride, some trichlor, or whatever the product was, it was done, and then doing a test on it. It didn't have the buildup of cyanuric acid in it. So there's a lot that needs to be improved. This is part of what, as I say, this is part of what I, both our committee and myself, really want to get improved in the EPA. The 4 ppm limit, the standard of should the laboratory efficacy be so extreme that it's going to prevent potentially some alternative uh, uh, methods that might have worked out okay? But we don't know because nobody tried. Could, nobody could get past that hurdle. So Carrie asked a question and then she left. So we'll answer it after she's left now. I'm sorry, what we're really debating is the 1979 standard, how do we apply it into the modern today? And how do we dig through 40 years of data and actually see whether there's a problem? Because nobody's been looking at some of these problems. So drawing the line is very difficult. And the committee worked for four years and there was still a lot of debate on it. 
So bottom line is you've got a really, 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 really good mathematical model that we could put a lot of numbers into, but you've got to pick and choose. And what we're talking about is every pool is different. Chemistry is different. Do we really have enough information today to draw where that line is to be protected for public health based upon what we know about tools today? Well, as far as operations, like we do need to decide how we're going to run our pools today. So I recommend a 20 to 1 race. Sales pitch number three. That is my question. Richard, what is the model of body health council coaching council going to do, going to recommend in the near future or yeah. Yeah. in terms of a ratio between the side of your What's the number? We're all waiting so, so prior so prior to the controversy, <laughs> when it was just the paper being published, it would have been a, a change request from twenty to one and we'll still have that. But we're gonna probably separate that out from other change requests for the model product health code because the paper demonstrated uh, multiple aspects of the science that need to get into the code. So that includes this definition of what pre chlorine is so that everybody's on the same page of understanding that what you're measuring is not the active chlorine that's in the pool. So don't be afraid of that number by itself of pre chlorine. Number two, the ratio does affect the disinfection. So that's the, the uh, second. Another is how often do you test cyanuric acid because of the rate of buildup that I talked about before, about the 10 and 6, 10 ppm and the 6 ppm, so for commercial public pools. And last, which is would be the con most controversial one, is what do you set as, as a, a, a standard in the code? We'll put that in there as 20 to 1. That came from our paper. But again, each of these things gets voted on, right, from the model part. It's not us forcing it down anyone's throat. So we'll see, we'll see where that goes. We, we chose, the 20 to 1 was not a magic number. It does, it does show that it kind of, you know, hits a line on a graph and so on, but that's, that's not really the reality of it. The reality of it, given the variation of the inputs, is trying to be a balance of what's operationally reasonable, potentially operationally reasonable to being able to reduce risk. Some, some. Um, but because of the controversy, people may vote it down. So we'll see what happens with it. Uh, that's the next cycle, this next cycle, when is it, two years, one year? Um, for, the, for the cycle for the model aquatic health code, there's, um, we'll be putting our change request in soon, hopefully. And um, and then it's open for public comment. So would definitely recommend that you become a member of the CMAC organization so you can go in and do your public comments yeah, and vote. Comment and then um, in October of next year is when the conference will happen where everybody will get together and talk about change requests. And then the voting will happen right after that. And then, you know, 2021 is when the actual next model of aquatic health code will come out. I've noticed that mostly only this side of the room is left. I think we have time for one more. Yeah. Thanks. I just wanted to clarify when you said that the ratio of 20 to 1 achieved disinfection, was that how are you measuring disinfection? Are you measuring it via OLP or some other? So, uh, actually what I'll do is I'll just, I'm not going to go in and give you the detail, but I want to put up the one uh, graph that makes it easy to, not graph, but to walk that uh, around. From the paper, the beginning, there it is. Right, so it's a, it's in, it's a model that takes this this part down here in the lower left is that chemistry part that we were talking about about the chlorine the pre chlorine cyanuric acid but also temperature and other factors and stuff but mainly pre chlorine cyanuric acid and pH and how that affects the hypochlorous acid which is the actual active disinfectant that does all the uh, disinfecting and killing of bacteria viruses protozoonosis and so on um, the upper left here is the fecal to you know how much shedding there is <laughs> and. Uh, but but wash okay that's the technical term all right so that's the that gives a pathogen introduction rate then over here is how much diffusivity there is in the water what that means is how much splashing water movement circulation and so on is the kind of overall uh rate of mixing and that's how long it takes to go from the person's bum to another person's mouth at a certain distance away that's what it is fecal to oral root that's what it is for those pathogens and <laughs> he studies it more than me, unfortunately. Not me, not me, not me. No? Okay. 
Uh, okay, so so from all that, that tells you the concentration of the pathogens in the water. So as it's leaving, there is it's getting disinfected, and as it, by the time it gets to the other person's mouth, a certain distance away, they're ingesting a certain amount of volume of water, and that has a certain amount of pathogen. Then uh, that's that ingestion rate there. And then as part of the, what's called a dose response model, which is where there's studies that say, well, if you ingest this number of oocysts or cysts or uh, CFUs, you know, a number of bacteria, uh, then you're going to you know, get this per percentage of people sick and so on. And more, the higher levels, you're going to be higher probability of getting sick. So you put all that together, the output number you get is what's your risk. So based on your being in the pool, but the net of what we found is, is if you have higher bathing load pools, you've got a lot of people with more percentage of them, or if not percentage, more of them are, they're all doing butt wash, but they're not all, they're all doing butt wash, but they're not all ill, but the higher, but a certain percentage of them are, so the probability goes up, and that's the net of it. Higher bathing load pools are, there's no question, higher bathing load pools are higher risk. At the end of the day, they're higher risk for giardia because they build up all day and then overnight when they go back down with this infection and back up. That's no question. The question is, where is it exactly and from a, from a regulatory and all that, is it bad enough to draw a line that's tight and all that? That's what comes to it. Does that answer your question? So we don't, so we don't really know, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an educated... No, it's an it's an, it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, No, no, the, yeah, I mean, the, the, this end number is based on the data and the variability of the data coming in. As you can imagine, the amount of, you know, uh, amount of fecal release and amount of uh, concentration there. The bottom line here is 95% confidence in all of this is a factor of five-ish, higher or lower. So it's broad ranges, right? So it's the best you can do with the available input. But, but as scary as that sounds, guess what? For all, this, for all the health stuff is done. Because when you get biologics, when you get people involved and all that, you get huge variability, and that's just the way that's going to be. Okay. So although there's tons of variability in how much fecal material is coming off and everything else, you can still look at relative, relative. risk. Yeah. So you can look at the that's relative risk best. of you know, the current model of conflict guidelines and the new proposal of 20 to 1. And then you're looking at relative risk, which kind of takes out all those other right. variables. Right. And, and you, I said kind of. <laughs> 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 anyway, so it's about a two-fold decrease in risk of giardia and about a five-fold decrease in risk um, for E. coli, changing from the current MAC um, regu um, recommendations to, to the 21 ratio. Yes, what was your question? Um, so, Jen, do I need a microphone? Yes, yeah, you need a microphone, Jen. We know you're quiet. <laughs> um, so we've had a lot of Okay, so we've had a lot of discussion today uh, regarding limitations in the model, variability in the model, relative risk, what is acceptable risk, which is still not defined um, for, for, for swimming pools. Um, we had a lot of discussion about missing data and, you know, what, what that data could do with the spreadsheet that Richard's put together and then me actually able to use that tool the way it's really um, designed to be utilized. So then that really begs the question, um, are we ready to actually recommend a ratio? Because shouldn't a ratio be met, recommended on science? And I'm not saying there's not a lot of good science in here, but we've addressed all the limitations, variability, and scientific uh, literature gaps that we need to address. So are we ready to recommend a ratio on a compromise of individuals on a panel? Shouldn't it be based on the science that we still need? I mean, even if we do recommend a ratio, aren't we still guessing? And isn't that ratio different for different for different uh, venues that have are different levels of risk that they're trying to address? <laughs> I think that I mean that pretty much reiterates the stand I've had. Every pool is different. This is a guess. That's like, where do you live? What state? Missouri. Missouri. Okay, so if you were to move, or if, I live in Florida, so if I was to move to New York, there's less of a chance of me being eaten by an alligator. This is the same thing. If you move from, anybody from the Northeast, if you move to Florida, your odds, Rhode Island, if you move to Florida, your odds of getting eaten by an alligator increase exponentially. That's what we just said. 
far as that 20 to 1 recommendation. It is a, a compromise, but there's science behind it. And we will never have all the data that we really want for all situations, for all the individual pools, for all the different things. And so, but based on what we know currently, are we ready to make a re recommendation of what the current science is showing us? Sure. And that's 20 to 1. So not being as facetious, I think that as long as we're looking at other factors, like I suggested earlier, such as ORP, where we can actually measure the efficacy of the chlorine in the water, I think establishing a ratio is fine. I think if we leave it at just the ratio without adding that, then it's all over the place, and you're correct, it's a guess. It has to have a means of measure. And it comes back to what Jen just said in there. It's like, when you look at the data gaps, we have people dying with Legionella right now. We have people getting sick with E. coli. We've got people getting sick with crypto. So we just spent an hour talking about something that we are debating on. Should we be focusing on something that is making people sick today that the numbers are solid on while we're working on getting the numbers so that we can use that model more effectively? That's my point. And Richard, Talk he's the king of spreadsheets. So, so the um, the good news with the model is, is that it's something that can be reused or or modified to handle accidental fecal releases, for example. So the next thing in our committee will look at that because what this what did come out, but there were some surprises for uh, what we discovered here. One was is that we didn't know going into it. At least I didn't know. I know but the, but that regular fecal sloughing, crypto, not an issue. Wouldn't show up. I mean, it's way low. Jardia is high enough that it wouldn't show up outbreaks, but it might be something that sustains it. But crypto is much lower. So what that means is, is that the AFR, the statistics that we see for outbreaks for crypto aren't coming from just even the highest of bather load pools. They're coming from AFRs, accidental fecal releases, large volume releases, diarrheal releases, okay? So that's an important aspect that comes out of it too. It wasn't necessarily known before. This modeling can be used then for the AFRs, which will be next. That's our next charter for, for what we're gonna look at. So it's not, I don't consider any of the, necessarily what we, you know, any of what we did was necessarily wasteful. And then also the other part of it is the front end part of the model which is the chemistry part, which doesn't have all this variability aspect of it, and it's much more clear. Um, it's very useful to understand and keep, and keep clear and something that we talk about you know, um, and used in reg it's a regulatory tool, as I showed before. Last but not least is, is that, and I don't want to be take too, to say this proves that the data was okay, but it's not that we did this in an isolation completely, all the modeling. At the end, we wanted to compare against some real pools. And we did find a, the best study, unfortunately, it's in China, not in the US, but it's still the best study that had 30 pools with over you know, uh, over 60 samples done. And they used real big 10 liter uh, volumes of water to, for the Jardia and the cryptos. They did a, a lot of things, and they did it at the end of the day. I mean, they almost checked every every box that we want. They didn't measure infectivity because hardly anybody does that for Giardia and the crypto, unfortunately. But other than that, uh, we had something to compare to. So we ran it, it was in the ballpark. It doesn't prove that the model is exactly right, but it does give us some sense that we're not just you know, off the deep end. And quite frankly, when we were first doing this work, we did use a different input uh, for data of fecal sloughing from a different source, and, the and it blew up the model. It wouldn't match something like this at all. It turned out it was from Gerba and it was shower data, and it was way high for the children data, I mean way high. And then, if the, the good news is, is that when a model is good enough that it shows that when there's a mistake in the inputs, that's pretty good. And that's what it did. And so then we looked at the source and we said, oh, no, these were showers with children. Then you look at the ages from the original source. It said down to 18 months. Okay, Anybody with toddlers knows, and you know, you've got a, a dirty toddler, and what are you going to do, clean them up before you go in the shower? No. So they're measuring a lot. Okay, so that's it. Okay, so we said, can't use that. Then we went on a search to find a more suitable study that was done at poolside, didn't have toddlers, did have children, some children, but mostly was adults and, and had a poolside. So we cleaned that up. So the foundation that we've done, I think, is you know is pretty pretty reasonable and can be used for other 
AFRs for crypto. I'd like to do this for spas as well, for the Legion Miller, given that that's how, how important that's been. And that's another, you know, that's a higher beta load situation in general, but it's also biofilm and, and uh, uh, other aspects. So this can be used for that as well. So, I mean, not as if, but we can make modifications to do it. So I think it was a lot of good work that was done, even if the final answer of whether it's 20 to one or not, whether that gets done or not, there's a lot of foundational work that think is valuable. Uh, we should give a big round of applause for a very excellent form of the panelists are fantastic. Uh, thank you for coming. If there are people with some further questions, you can try to wrestle these people to the ground uh, before they get out. Thank you. We need to shake the hand.